Thank you, Chris. Hello, everyone. Um, can I just check that people can see the slides and hear yep. me okay? Yep, all good. Super. So uh, today I'm just going to take you through the main parts of my project on the use of tagging for wildlife research. Wildlife research is understandably concerned mainly with species and collectives, communities, and my unit of study is the individual. And it's not that I don't think conservation is important, I just think that um, it's important to be mindful of the individual when you consider an intervention. So for me, an ecosystem is made up of individual sentient beings rather than collectives. And there can be a tension between conservation and animal welfare, and that's really at the heart of my project. So today I am just going to go through the aims of my research and some of my current findings. I'm in quite a data heavy phase at the minute, so I'm collecting a lot of data that has not been thoroughly analysed. So I'll just be giving you some snippets today and things that I've learned from the literature and then hopefully move on to discuss what my next steps might be. And I'd be very keen to have ideas from you um, if you've got experiences of some of the things that I am hoping to look for in the future. So my ethical framework, if you like, is based on compassionate conservation. And I won't spend a lot of time on this because Oscar covered this nicely yesterday. Um, but essentially, it's a virtue ethic that emphasizes the importance of the individual. So regardless of species or rarity, the priority is to do no harm. But it also demands self-evaluation. So it's looking to researchers to, to consider their actions and consider themselves as having an active role in the process rather than just standing back and objectively studying something. They are part of that process and they should take responsibility for their practice. Um, conservationists have been engaging with compassionate conservationists and having a debate about this issue. Um, what I would call a more traditional conservation ethic is largely consequentialist. So it's about the greatest good for the greatest number, trying to stop species becoming extinct. And um, Matt Hayward and others, no relation of mine, um, have put it quite succinctly by saying that the compassionate tail should not wag the conservation dog. So for them, conservation is the overriding concern. And there are degrees of compassionate conservation. So for some, it might mean no intervention at all. For others, it might be habitat or plant protection. And then following on from that, other species will benefit. For some, there will be interventions that they consider to be um, humane. But there are also areas where there's been a bit more debate. So there are less clear cut issues. And I think this links nicely with what Oscar was talking about yesterday as well, because one of the ones that um, Hayward challenges them over is issues like overgrazing. So for them, it would be more ethical to kill deer, for example, in an area where there's overgrazing, rather than leaving them to suffer. And for a compassionate conservationist, that would be less clear cut. So those are the kinds of arguments that I'm investigating. And I have two main questions that I am hoping to get to the bottom of. So the first is to explore ethics and decision making among wildlife taggers. And I use the term tagging but it encompasses visual markers. So that could be a leg band on a bird. It could be as in the picture of the hawk here, um, a wing tag. So something that's very bright, colorful, it's got clear numbers or letters on that you can see from a distance or you can see with binoculars and you know who that is. So they're not actually collecting any data but they allow people to go out and, and find these individuals. Uh, monitoring devices are slightly different because they actually collect information. So that might be stored 
on a chip on the tag. Um, so an example is here uh, with a turtle. So that's a tag that's glued onto the back of the turtle and that will be collecting information. Some of those have to be retrieved again. So they might fall off and send a pinger and then people can go and collect them. Um, you might have to catch the animal to take the tag off. Some of them will send back the information via satellite. So that might be in real time or at regular intervals. So really I'm looking at anything that's in or on an animal that's living free in the wild. And I've um, decided to include all vertebrates, which I wasn't sure about initially, but I have come around to the idea because I think had I not done that, I wouldn't have had enough data. I have been criticised for that by at least one respondent who felt, um, understandably, that you can't compare fish with a land mammal, for example, because their physiology, their habitat is completely different. And I think that that's a fair point. Um, but what I feel they all have in common is sentience. And so I think for that reason and to collect large amounts of data, I think I feel OK about focusing on, on all vertebrates. My second um, focus is looking at communication and collaboration. So I'm looking at communication within a research group and collaboration between research groups and how that might enable improved welfare. So it could be sharing experiences or sharing designs for tag attachments or sharing data so that that reduces the number of additional animals that have to be tagged. And I'm doing this um, in an iterative way by combining survey data and interviews, which I have already carried out, um, then putting that information back to the original group so that they look at it again and they look at the anonymous group data and reflect on their views in relation to the group. So my progress so far, I've carried out an initial survey and that showed that 72% had experienced difficulties attaching a device and 41% had experienced compromised welfare as a result of their tagging work. Obviously there is potential for bias there. While I, I used Web of Science to try and get um, an unbiased group, um, the chance that they will fill it in may well be biased by their own experiences. However, having said that, 59% hadn't experienced welfare. This is self-reported, so they didn't feel that anything had compromised welfare. So I did have different views represented. The predominant view was that tagging is essential for conservation, but there was a willingness to continually explore the equipment and the methods that were used. And again, there could be a possible bias there. So people who are willing to engage with this are perhaps more likely to have taken part in this research. And it's clear that there are three areas where ethics and welfare are relevant. So initially, when I was first interested in this topic, it was mainly focused on deployment because that's the obvious thing that you see. So you see a collar on a cat, you see a, a tag on a kite. Um, but there are lots of other areas and the other areas seem to be much more of a concern to the researchers. So they are much more concerned about capture, handling and attachment. So for attachment, for example, it's is it easy to put on, particularly if you're out at sea tagging a shark? So there are safety issues for the humans as well. Can it be adjusted? So if you've got one off the shelf, can you adjust it for individual animals? individual times of year. So there are issues to do with how that tag is carried by the animal. And then when considering actually deploying the tag, is the tag going to be on that animal long term? Will you have to catch the animal to take it off? Does it have a self-release mechanism? So some of them have material that is designed to degrade so that the tag will fall off. Does that work every time? Issues like the effect of the shape of the tag and the weight. Um, in the past, the weight was the thing that most people were focused on, but now people are 
considering the shape to be more of an issue than the actual weight of the tag. So where is it on the body? Is it um, contoured in such a way that it allows the animal to still be streamlined? In lab animals, we would talk about an end point. So one of the things I have been interested to put to researchers is um, what is your end point? Do you have a plan to intervene if there is a problem? And a few people are researching things like the shape of tags, where you put the tag. Um, that's largely driven by the need for good science, but that's not to the exclusion of welfare benefits too. And what I found through um, interviews in particular was that context is crucial. So that has been um, drummed into me several times by people. Um, so for example, are there even pilot studies taking place? So pilot studies are not necessarily taking place. So clearly that's something that people felt should happen. And if they are taking place, are they representative of a typical life? So if the context isn't right, is there really any point in the pilot study? Does that really tell you how the animal is going to experience wearing this tag? Um, I don't know how I am for time, so I'll just go through this one quickly. So I'm assuming that people can see these slides after. So if you're interested in going back to have a look at this, you could look at the cartoon in more detail. This is only a, a section of it. So I've delved into this story a bit because I found it really fascinating. It was sent to me because someone knew I was doing this project. And it's about a group of birds who learned how to remove their own trackers, but a couple of them then went around the whole of the group and took them off everybody else. So they were clearly showing that they didn't like them and they were also able to help out the other birds and remove them within a few hours. I think all the tags were off. Um, what I liked about this was that the birds had clearly made a choice and this is a subject area where you can't really ask them you're making that decision for them that they have to wear some kind of device but these birds were able to say they didn't want to do that and what's interesting is obviously they were socially able to express that cognitively they they had the anatomy to be able to physically get that tag off and that may not be available to all animals so in the future, I am in the process of putting together a second survey to go back to those people to reflect on their initial responses. And from that, I would like to come up with some way of improving access to information about all the available technology, the different experiences researchers have, perhaps with the option of anonymity. So it could be that there's one portal that has all the information so it's easy to find and all in one place and what I'd be really keen to get out of of this conference is um, some tips from people who are used to dealing with dissent and, and people with different views and trying to resolve that pragmatically and have those kinds of conversations so if anybody has advice about that if they want to reach out that would be fantastic um, that here are some references if anyone's interested in reading a bit more about this subject area. And thank you very much for listening. Uh, first of all, thank you to the organizers for the conference and for this opportunity and all of you for listening. I will just start straight away. The last two years have marked the worst cases of highly pathogenic avian influenza outbreaks all around the world since the last serious wave of outbreaks between 2014 and 15. Mass killings of birds because of avian influenza between only January and June 2022 amounted to 73 million birds. If we examine the outbreaks in recent years, since the last month of 2020, when the world was still is already battling a zoonotic pandemic, news articles have reported countless avian influenza cases amongst birds and, hum birds and humans. Lockdowns to keep birds inside were put into effect across Europe and the US. 
with the rapidly increasing number of outbreaks and their extensive geographical distribution, the question of how to kill millions of poultry in order to stop the spread of the virus with no concern for bird welfare has once again arisen and mass depopulation methods such as the use of firefighting foam or carbon dioxide to cut off air supply or ventilation shutdown followed by the disposal of dead birds by burying in landfill sites or composting with other ingredients on farms are actually currently recommended by the USDA. So, oh, sorry. So what is avian influenza? Avian influenza viruses are influenza category A viruses, which have fast evolution capabilities. Compared to influenza C that causes common cold and B <clears throat> that causes winter flu, domestic birds, pigs, and humans have no prior immunity to these evolving viruses, which means they constitute possible pandemic threats, especially if any of the subtypes gains human-to-human -human transmission ability. Although the primary reservoir of avian influenza is wild birds and waterfowl in particular, it lives in their bodies harmlessly. And it is when avian influenza infects new hosts and that it becomes dangerous with up to almost 100% mortality amongst domestic birds and 60% amongst humans. Avian influenza led to the death or killing of about, sorry, about 376 million birds from January 2005 to April 2022. These numbers were in addition to the routine killing of at least 20, uh, 75 billion birds each year within the poultry industry, whereby they are raised in overcrowded ammonia and disease-filled factory farms, mutilated, being forced to live on top of each other and their manure, being subjected to an untimely and violent death many years before their expected lifetime. During the initial wave of H5N1, the deadliest subtype of avian influenza, migratory birds and backyard chickens of subsistence farmers were blamed by the media and health organizations for causing the outbreaks, which led to the killing of millions of rural birds. But with the cyclical and routine reemergence of avian influenza viruses since 1997, almost every winter season, the practices and processes of the world poultry industry were indicated by a diverse range of scientists as suspects for aiding the evolution and increased virulence of avian influenza. So, and we can also extend these discussions to the link between zoonotic pathogens and industrial animal agriculture in general. I will now give some examples from this research. According to the Changing Disease Landscapes report of FAO, most of the new diseases that have emerged in humans over recent decades are of animal origin and are related to the human quest for more animal source food. And it points to particularly industrial, large-scale domestic and wild animal meat production, dense livestock populations, international trade and globalization, monoculturalization, agricultural encroachment on forested land and wild habitats for growing of cereals, the use of antibiotics as main drivers of zoonotic epidemics. Another research on the HPAI epidemic in Thailand in 2004 argues that it was the large commercial operations with high densities of birds per flock that were the determinant factors for the risk, virulence, and transmission of the virus to humans rather than backyard flocks. They further emphasize that intensive production and large densities in commercial operations, the utilization of large ventilation fans, untreated poultry waste dispersed on land, the movement of rats and flies in and out of the houses, poor protection of workers might have led to the epidemic and many of the biosecurity measures, which are standard in commercial operations, actually fell short of reducing the risk. 
They concluded that industrial bird farming is not more biosecure or biocontained, despite the stance of health organizations and local governments of affected areas at the time. Another research uh, argues that contrary to the common emphasis on the wild animal reservoirs of zoonotic diseases, the environments of industrial animal agriculture generate unique ecosystems that facilitate the emergence and evolution of zoonotic pathogens by acting firstly as a bridge and secondly as the locus of pathogen evolution itself because pathogens are allowed to circulate amongst dense populations of farmed animals. They discussed that design and operational requirements of large-scale poultry and swine houses in and of themselves result in compromises of biosecurity that are the results of the profit-driven practices and processes of industrial animal farming, such as the movement of animals between production stages. Sorry, yeah. Further, they discussed that oh, H5N1 was disproportionately reported in commercial intensive operations rather than in backyard flocks. During the previous outbreaks around the world, low pathogenic avian influenza infections actually preceded the emergence of highly pathogenic ones on the same commercial farms showing how once avian influenza is introduced into an industrial operation, it can become highly pathogenic. Another uh, uh, article argues against not only the dominant discourse of wildlife as reservoirs of zoonosis, but also the common argument that zoonotic infectious diseases emerge especially from Asia. They argue that in the case of avian influenza, viruses, outbreaks have occurred in both low-income and high-income countries, and more importantly, the outbreaks tended to coincide with the periods when production was intensifying. This means that the emergence of HPAI viruses depends more on the intensification of poultry capital around the world and the opportunities of transmission and mutation provided to, provided to viruses by local production and consumption practices that might elevate chances of further infection. All these factors mean that intensified industrial poultry and swine production constitutes a higher risk of HPAI emergence than other methods of farming. Mm. Jones et al. systematic review on the link between agricultural intensification and anthropogenic change in cases of emergence of zoonosis shows that 58% of pathogens known to affect humans and 73 of the newly emerging percent of the newly emerging pathogens are zoonotic, most of which can be strongly associated with modern farming practices and intensified systems that facilitate zoonotic pathogen emergence and amplification from HIV, Ebola, SARS, swine flu, avian influenza to routine salmonella outbreaks in factory farms, infectious pathogens that gained ability to transmit to perhaps billions of humans are the results of capitalist exploitation of nature, particularly animals at large. So the articles I summarized so far, in addition to uh, many others exemplify the growing understanding of the strong link between industrial animal agriculture and the emergence of zoonotic pathogens, even though they provide differing forms of em emphasis on the capitalist nature of intensive farmed animal production. Bringing these discussions together, I argue that unless steps are taken to seize the practices of capitalist poultry industry, the continuous emergence of not only avian influenza, but other zoonotic diseases is inescapable. This calls for an anthropocentric One Health approach that recognizes the industrial suffering and commodification of birds as the culprit of the emergence of avian influenza. I now turn to your recent article by Anthony and Vieria, who proposed an ethics of care approach to One Health animal disaster management. One Health was developed at the beginning of the 21st century as a response to the newly emerging zoonotic diseases, and it is concerned with the entanglement of human, animal, and environmental health. 
One Health has been endorsed by and incorporated into the guidelines of global health organizations. And the disaster management cycle includes planning, prevention, mitigation, preparedness, response, recovery, and reconstitution. The, the authors <clears throat> argue that One Health challenges us to recognize species interconnectedness and interdependencies. The two important imaginaries at the core of One Health include the disposition toward relational thinking and solidarity in a public health crisis or disaster and shared vulner vulnerab vulnerability. That is recognizing that harms to animals are strongly correlated with harms to humans. However, they also argue that the global pandemic response has exposed significant gaps and challenges in emergency prevention, preparedness and planning, especially the insufficient emphasis on animal welfare and disaster management. They raise especially the concerns of depopulation, emergency killing, and manner of animal death during disasters. So they propose an ethics of care approach, which they think provides an alternative imaginary regarding humans' moral responsibility. Our Fellowship with animals is action guiding and forms the basis of our care, compassion, and respect toward them, according to the authors. Basically, they argue that we need to challenge the anthropocentric tendencies of One Health and shift it towards an ethics of care approach that is concerned with animal welfare and responsibility to animal dependence, especially during disasters. Although I believe their discussion proposes a challenge to One Health, considering the link between industrial animal agriculture and zoonotic diseases that I tried to emphasize through the context of avian influenza and poultry industry here, a truly un un unanthropocentric approach to One Health would be the stage-by-stage -stage phasing out of industrial animal agriculture that has proven again and again to be breeding disease. If we are really concerned with entangled multi-species health, well-being, and sustainability, such an approach to one health has been missing from the statements and guidelines of health organizations. Although it seems necessary more than ever before to consider ending industrial animal agriculture at the face of the cluster of crises we are facing today. Thank you for listening. Oh, I love the drawing on the, the first page. <laughs> um, thank you. That's one drawing that I also used in my data analysis because I was also working with pictures and I will talk about this in a minute. So um, now we're in the field of animal assisted interventions. And in my PhD project, I was investigated, investigating on uh, children's perspectives on equine assisted interventions. And um, as a quick overview, I uh, will talk about my research question and also about the published scientific articles because it was a cumulative PhD project. And after giving an insight um, in the methods, I will give an overview of the main results of the study. So in this picture, you see the um, an overview for my uh, scientific articles. Um, at the bottom, you see that I uh, started with a kind of research in the about the research field. So I started a critical reflection on existing explanatory approaches in the research field because I found that many theories are not really empirical proven by now, but are spread all over the literature, and so I didn't want to reproduce um, approaches that are not really proven and this was my first step in my PhD project. The next step was um, to have a look at the state of research. So I was looking um, for articles that um, are on the topic of mental health for children in equine assisted interventions and I found uh, 25 uh, um, studies on this. 
And there I also found uh, the research gap that I was working on later. And I was uh, wanting to know what is relevant from a children's perspective on equine assisted interventions, because most of the studies were just focused on an adult point of view. So teachers um, or parents were asked about the child. So I wanted to um, find this new perspective on the field and was looking for methods that uh, fit well for children. So um, on the one hand, I was working with interviews and on the other hand with children's drawings. I had uh, semi-structured interviews um, because they are more detailed than the drawings, but also the drawings were like um, additional data. And also um, it was um, easier for the children to get into the conversation with me. Because at the beginning of the interview, I asked them to draw a picture of themselves at the stable. Later, I will show you more of those pictures. And uh, in the main study, I connected these two approaches and um, was um, using the interviews and the drawings um, in a survey with 20 children. So it was a, it's a qualitative research and I was um, using grounded theory to analyze um, the children's perspectives. There were seven girls and 13 boys between seven and 14 years. And all of them took part in the equine assisted intervention due to increased psychosocial stress um, because most of them could not uh, grow up in their families, but in residential living groups from the government because of different reasons. I investigated on uh, two interventions, both were very similar and both had, for example, a certificated pedagogical writing instructor. And um, they gave weekly sessions from one to two hours. And um, in the sessions, they um, they were grooming the horse, doing groundwork, vaulting, lunging, or riding the horse. It was uh, very individually too. And um, the goals were strengthening competencies or gaining skills on an emotional or social level. So all in all, my results show two key categories which is on the one hand, the support of interpersonal trust and on the other hand, support of self-confidence. So trusting others and trusting oneself. Here I'm referring to the social learning theory. So I believe that um, this kind of trust is uh, learned by experience over time. Um, interpersonal trust was uh, gained um, through a positive and trusting relationship with the writing instructor. Um, I think this is very important because most of the studies don't mention the therapeutic relationship to the human, to the writing instructor, but um, it was this person that gave security in the setting and structure, and also she's an expert for the horse, helps the child to gain more confidence and learn, so this is a very important part. Then the children also talk about positive experiences with the horse. So they experience trust, relaxation, they notice that it has a positive effect on their emotional state and many other points that I um, will, I cannot get into detail too much. And also uh, when the equine assisted setting was taking place in a group, there was a benefit that they could um, help each other or learn to resolve conflicts. Um, in the part of self-confidence, it was very important for the children that they overcome fears, challenges, and new tasks with the horse. Um, so many children talk about how they are really afraid in the first sessions with the horse and really have to get to know the animal. And by this, they gain increasing independence and also by dealing with their own limits. The children also talk about various learning opportunities, so they are, it's very important for them to talk about their um, um, specific knowledge that they gain. So that's something that the children are 
proud of. I want to refer a bit to uh, theoretical references. Um, for my results, so um, interpersonal trust has a positive effect on mental health and coping with stress, and it is proven by literature that um, the therapeutic relationship, if you have a trusting and good relationship, then it enhances the effectiveness of the intervention. Also, animals can be perceived as a social support, and also they can be um, like a, a social catalyst where it's easier for human individuals to interact when there is an animal with them. Um, if we go on a physical level, there's also shown that oxytocin level is going up and cortisol level is going down, um, not only by uh, riding the horse, but also when having, for example, um, just contact with a dog, or, and there are many studies on this. And um, if it, if the intervention takes place in a group, there's also the benefit that um, social skills can be improved and uh, model learning is possible. Um, on the um, topic of self-confidence, we can say that it has uh, also a positive effect on mental health and stress management if the children expect from themselves that they can manage different or um, situations or even situations where they are afraid of. Um, also, uh, increasing one's self-esteem is a basic psychological need. And the children that I interviewed were in a development phase where it's very um, important for them to show that they can achieve something and do something new. The learning opportunities in the animal assisted setting are also a healing factor and um, increased self-esteem is a common effect of equine assisted therapy. Um, as a conclusion, I put everything in one sentences to have an overview. So in equine assisted interventions with the aim of supporting mental health, the pedagogical riding instructor creates situations with horses that strengthen the interpersonal trust and self-confidence of children, in particular by supporting them in overcoming challenges with the horse. And I think um, that we have still a lot more to explore in the field of animal-assisted therapy. Um, I think a very important topic is also animal welfare, so it could be interesting to involve um, the animal's point of view, or there are also concepts of one health, so what is the benefit from the horse, so the horse should also benefit from the situation. For example, if you go to um, play therapy, that can be an interesting point. And also, I want to refer to um, a presentation from yesterday, which was from uh, Samantha Horn. And I thought this was very inspiring when she was talking about animals with disabilities. And I was thinking that there would be a great possibility to connect animals with disabilities um, with humans with disabilities. So I think there would be a great opportunities for animals and for humans. Yes, and um, also you can contact me if you're interested in the articles. I can send uh, them to you. And also right now I'm looking for a job as a researcher and teacher in the field of human assisted studies, uh, human animal studies or animal assisted therapy, everything in this field. So if you know something, also feel free to contact me. Then um, this is my literature and thanks for your attention and um, maybe you have some questions for me. Thank you.